This, this was my Nokia 8250. And at the time, in my early, oh, I must have been around 18, this was the bee's knees. This was where mobile phones were at. You know, you could play Snake on it, you could send text messages, which were new at the time, and it was small, it fit in that little pocket in your jeans, and do not underestimate the coolness of the blue screen at the time. Now, of course, fast forward 18 years, things have changed. And we now have... Uh, my phone actually is, sorry, is much larger. Ironically, perhaps, the phone is bigger than it was back then. And unfortunately, the waistline is a bit too. But also so is my understanding of how technology shapes us, how it shapes our behaviours. And so recently I had the pleasure of long service leave. And I thank my English forebears for this privilege. And I took my time to travel in Europe. I spent about four months travelling in Europe. I took only a little turtle shell backpack, so I only had carry-on backpack, but I also managed to take a couple of banks, an insurance agency, uh, a guy I called Gerald, who was my translator, uh, an internet browser, a GPS navigation system, and of course, an internet browser, if I didn't mention that. And of course, this was my iPhone. Now, when I was in Iceland, the land of things that explode, a bit like Dr. Thomas's presentation, and things that smell and all the rest of it, <coughs> I decided to go to Bruefoss. Bruefoss is a waterfall. And it's probably a little hard to see here, but this is the dot marking where I am. This is the car park where I started. And that's maybe four kilometers or thereabouts. And it all started great. It was this wonderful path. It's pretty. It's Iceland. You know, there's a lot to look at. And then it just became this sopping, muddy mess. And I was literally up to my knees in mud. I'm losing my shoe. It sort of sucks off. And I was clinging at times to little bits of grass and roots and things to actually stop myself sliding off into the icy, raging river right next to me. So needless to say, when I got there, I took a, a nice blue dot because I wanted to remember the fact that I'd actually made it, but I didn't want to go back. And so I had to do some map to ground. I had to use some of my army training. And it's, again, hard to see, but there's a lot of... Not, there's not actually any roads through here, but there were gravel paths and some houses and sorts of odd things like that. And so my thought was, no worries. I got this. And this is the point I'm getting at. I managed to get out, I walked, you know, walked myself out. I actually did a big loop around through here and down along the road. But the key point is here, yes, the technology has changed. The technology can do lots of things that it couldn't do previously. But what's also changed is us. The way I approached the situation, the way I thought about the situation, my response to the situation was all mediated by the technology, but it was me, myself, that had actually changed my thinking. And this is the point, technology shapes us. I had the pleasure recently of listening to a CBC Massey lecture by Neil Turok, who's a cosmologist and distinguished physicist, theoretical physicist in, in Canada. And he spoke about many topics, broadly the history of physics. And one of the things he touched on was the quantum nature of reality. And it's all very confusing. So if you know nothing about quantum physics, which is like me, don't worry, because no one does. It's really complicated stuff. Even Einstein was famously critical of it, you know, about how non-intuitive it was. So what we, one of the things he spoke about was quantum computers. Now, at the moment, we have a lot of change in society. Yes, there's social media, there's things coming through. Blockchains are starting to make an impact. And quantum computers exist, and they are getting better. At the moment, Google has managed to get around 72 qubits in an entangled state. And the reason this matters is that digital data is a zero or one. But a qubit, as one bit, as a quantum bit, is able to consider information in far more powerful ways. If a quantum computer was to reach 300 qubits, it would be able to consider every single atom in the entire visible universe simultaneously. And you consider the computational power that that would engender, and you match it with something like artificial intelligence, and wowee, things are going to change. So yes, the technology will continue to change, but it's going to change us. One of the things that uh, Neil Turok talks about is, of course, the systems that govern the world. So quantum mechanics, he argues, is a way of understanding the world. But he is a cosmologist. He talks about the universe. 
you know, and so we have nebula, we have the solar system, we have the moon dictating the, uh, the, the tides, which of course messes with my afternoon run on the beach because of how hard the sand is. It's either too soft, it's too hard, whereas, you know, so systems impact on us. And of course, this goes all the way down to microsystems to the level of quantum physics and Planck's theories and, and these kinds of things. So what we end up is a scenario where we have lots of systems operating at multiple levels. We have technolog technological change and more and more dramatic technological change coming. And the question is sort of, what on earth are we to make of all of this? And the answer is 42, but only if you've read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. For most people though, uh, the answer is this idea of the good life. People just want to live the life that they see as the good life. And there are many different conceptions of it. I particularly like this one. This is from Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. And his basic op proposition is human flourishing. Now he goes on to unpack it in various ways, but the idea is central to the good life is that people and human potential flourish. And so the question I have for you, or what I'm here to discuss, is how we can take this understanding of complex systems and how we can focus in on the human potential and the development of human beings. Most change is systematic, particularly in organizations. There's a new objective, they come in, this is what we're doing, there's time, there's management, there's resources, and it's a push, 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 push scenario designed to achieve an outcome. It more or less bludgeons people into conformity. This is an outdated way of thinking. There is still a place for systematic thinking. What I'm here to discuss with you, though, is systemic thinking. Now, this is consideration of how a part exists within a whole. So in the same way that you exist now on the planet Earth and it's rotating the sun and you have a system inside you that's processing your dinner from earlier, you know, there's systems everywhere. What we want to consider is how systemic thinking can help to model and change and create what we call emergent phenomena. This scenario here is probably difficult to see. It's yellow, black and red. And what happens is it's a, a net logo model. It's an agent-based modeling piece of software. And what it models is how individuals interact with other individuals and how these build compounding effects and lead to what are called emergent phenomena. So what we really want then is systemic thinking using this kind of agent-based modeling kind of mindset designed to achieve the emergent phenomena that we want and not achieve the emergent phenomena that we do not want. You only need to look as far as social media to look at some positives, but also some emergent phenomena that are very negative. And so, what are young people to do? There's all this change coming, it's all very complex, it's all very, there's all these systems going on, they're interacting, and there's all these things happening that we can't control. And the answer starts with a hot shower. So the first thing you need to do is take a hot shower. Now, my apartment is freezing. It, it's honestly, it's an iceberg. I don't know why, it's to do with the way the air flows around it. So every morning I wake up and I wanna get in a hot shower. So it's a race over the shower, you turn the hot water on, and ah, it's too hot. So of course you turn the hot water down, but then, oh, it's cold, now it's too cold, and then you turn it back up again, and then you're in and out of the shower, and eventually you get it right. And what this is, is a feedback loop. And this is the power of systemic thinking, is it allows you to identify leverage points where you can move from a desired state, or from a current state to a desired state. The diagram on the screen encapsulates the basic principle. It's a cyclical loop. It doesn't loop once, it continues to loop and reinforce a particular type of behavior or a particular outcome that you're trying to achieve. Now, in and of itself, a single loop like that isn't particularly interesting. What's much more interesting is how one system interacts with other systems. And this is how we lead to this idea of emergent phenomena. And you can be designed for, you can manage complexity and difficulty by designing for it. This particular design, I've gone too far, focuses here on student learning. And the idea is these blue loops that run all the way through are all reinforcing loops. They're designed to reinforce, ultimately, the center node, which is student learning. And there are some balancing loops which create delays and create some problems. And so this is the toolkit that you have moving forward to deal with complexity, to deal with the change that is coming in our society. This is Thomas Edison, and contrary to some people's beliefs, he did not invent the incandescent light bulb. No, what he did, as my previous speaker discussed, was innovate. 
Because innovation is not ideation, it is not creation of newness. Newness is good, we want ideas, but innovation, the hard work of getting things implemented in ways that value and build on human potential and develop humans towards eudaimonia, this is what we want. So the next time that you come across a light bulb or somebody else's light bulb, or you recognize that the system in which you operate, usually an organization, needs to respond to other ecological changes around it, I want you to think systemically. I want you to identify the leverage points to build in the feedback system loops that will ultimately develop human potential and lead to human flourishing.